The key to ultrasound of inguinal hernias is in the identification of landmarks. If we cannot identify these specific landmarks, we cannot identify the inguinal canal. And if we cannot identify the inguinal canal, we cannot identify an inguinal hernia. So an ultrasound is exactly the same. We identify the pubic tubercle, the inguinal ligament, the inferior epigastrics, which we can pick up deep to the rectus abdominis muscle, and then the inguinal canal. And we need to assess the inguinal canal in short axis. There are numerous pitfalls when it comes to hernia assessment, which can be assessed essentially eliminated by assessing the canal in short axis. From here, we get the patient to strain or valsalva, and we're looking for something to push through and distend the canal. Movement either side is normal, but if we have movement through the canal, then we have a hernia. And from here, it's simply a matter of determining whether this comes lateral to the epigastrics, that is, we have an indirect inguinal hernia, or medial to the epigastrics, that is, a direct inguinal hernia. And we must be aware that we can have a concurrent ipsilateral direct and indirect inguinal hernia, which is known as a pantaloon hernia, specifically a Romberg hernia. Here we can see fat moving through and distending the canal. The defect is lateral to the epigastrics and as such we have an indirect inguinal hernia. In this case we once again see fat moving through the canal with the defect arising medial to the epigastrics consistent with a direct inguinal hernia. Generally speaking these hernias are repaired with mesh and you can see by the size of the mesh why a recurrent hernia is rare. It's important to identify the mesh and in the rare case of a recurrent hernia this will come lateral or medial to the mesh. Recurrent pain post hernia repair is not uncommon and this can be due to a number of factors including neuralgia of the ilioinguinal or genitofemoral nerve where ultrasound can play a role in the guidance of injection therapy. One such pitfall of hernia assessment is preperitoneal fat which in long can mimic a small non-reducible indirect inguinal hernia. In short axis this fat will not distend the canal and we won't be able to reduce this. So be aware preperitoneal fat. In this example we see with straining we have excess movement medial to the inguinal canal causing some displacement and rotation of the canal but nothing's pushing through the canal there's no fascial defect and there is therefore no inguinal hernia this is posterior wall laxity which in the young and athletic population is often termed a sportsman's hernia for femoral hernias, again, the identification of landmarks is crucial. From our inguinal ligament picture, we move slightly inferiorly where we can identify the pectineus and common femoral vessels. The femoral canal is located slightly medial to the common femoral vein. And with straining, we're looking for movement at this location, which will prevent complete dilation of that common femoral vein. On ultrasound, we identify the inguinal ligament, move slightly inferiorly, and we can locate the iliopectineal eminence the pectineus and the common femoral vein. With straining, we're looking for movement here as demonstrated in this clip. The management of femoral hernias can be slightly different. This is a CT that reported a nodular soft tissue density within the right groin, query atypical lymph node. But on ultrasound, we can see a linear echogenic line with some minor shadowing consistent with a prolene hernia repair plug. Thanks for watching, guys. Like and subscribe for more.